Yeah, hey, yeah, what's up? It's Tajay from the Souls of Mischief crew. One quarter of the Souls of Mischief, one eighth the high row, 100% Tajay. One of it was the beats, like the beats were different than anything. You you know, like before hip hop, it was funk and funk was hard, but it was a different kind of hard. It was like a, it wasn't a, I don't know, like you listen to the beat to the message like that. It's like the soundtrack to Armageddon almost, like broken glass everywhere. That beat just goes so well with what they're talking about. So the beats got me into it. Also, just the fact that you could do it. Like, it wasn't something where you had to have a great singing voice or you had to have vocal training or you had to have um, equipment. You could just do it. So I think those two things. And it wasn't just rapping. You know, we were breakdancing and doing graffiti and all that kind of stuff, too. I don't know, probably just seeing breakers, like, out in the streets, you know, with jackets very similar to this, I guess. Like, crews, the uniformity of it, like, the the... the the obviously they were a group mentality because they had they signified themselves as as a group that was kind of cool to me so like i seen the breaker crews um seeing two short rock live with um de la and ll and uh slick rick and all them at the coliseum because too short was like an accessible human being like wow that's too short and he's at the coliseum and he's got a rope just like everybody else and everybody knows his songs like to me, that was good. And he also came out and squashed some violence in the, in the crowd. So to see that like amount of power, it was it was interesting, and especially for it to be used for good. So I would say, yeah, Breaking Crews, really, because it was the acrobatics and the sort of uniformity of it, and then to see the power of like Two Short's words. Oh, man, we just did Hyro Day, dude. That was crazy. It was probably five, 7,000 people there. It was insane, man. And it was a free event. And I mean, you know, a lot of people just came because it was a free event. But I think you see the effect that you've had on everybody in the world when your family comes out to see you and it's in your own city. It's an event we threw, like our first real event that we threw, and it was like a cr crazy smashing success. So to me, that felt made me feel like a kid, like like a kid looking outside of myself, sort of looking at some, some guy, like, like looking at Too Short, kind of, except it was us. So that was cool. We all have the same... Like, we're all speaking one language, right? Or maybe, let's put it like this, we all have the same little bag of 26 characters that make up words. But the way we put them together is sort of what creates dialect and what creates dialogue and stuff like that. So I think that the way I attack it is just different because my influences are different and me as a human being, I'm different. Like, you know, I grew up in East Oakland, California. It was bodies and crack and people getting shot. I grew up in a single parent household, but on the same token, you know, my mom was a professor. I went to Stanford and I go to Cal now. So I've seen, I'm saying that not as far as the education aspect, but as far as the exposure aspect. Like I've seen the entire gamut of, not the entire gamut, but you see what I'm saying? A wide spectrum, a wide swath of, of human life and human experience. Even through hip hop, like traveling and, and being in Europe, being in Japan, being in Africa. You know, my mom when we were little, like we used to be broke, but she'd take us out somewhere every year on vacation. So I went to Africa when I was like six. You know, but seeing that, like seeing a whole continent of a country of, of people who look like me and planes weren't falling out the sky. The doctors were operating just like anybody else. You know, the policemen weren't harassing you for being black. You know, like it just expanded my mind. So I think that my experience as a human being, I sort of bring that into my perspective as a rapper. I look up to a lot of dance hall artists and I look up to like P-Funk and them as far as showmanship and all that kind of stuff. So I think that since I grew up in an era where showmanship was very important and it wasn't just about videos or it wasn't just about uh, a record on the radio because was, rap wasn't even played on the radio, I just attack it from a different different angle. Oh, making money uh, while not being on radio or TV whatsoever? Probably That's probably the biggest challenge. I mean, we eat well off of the shit that we're doing. And the last record you heard from us on the radio was 93 Till Infinity. And that was 20 years ago. Yeah, I think about it like that. Like, they don't play our music on the radio. They don't even have hip-hop shows anymore on the radio, on mainstream radio, as far as wake-up show. There's no jukebox on TV, so there's no egalitarian sort of democratic way of picking videos, so they're playing bullshit on TV, the same bullshit. It's all one company that owns all the TV channels, as far as they play hip-hop. It's pretty much two companies that own all the radio, and they have a robot, robot programming the music, you know? They might as well get rid of the radio DJs except for those special little hour-long middle-of-the-night shows because they're not doing anything but reading a script. 
So to me, it's being able to survive and thrive without having any mainstream exposure except literally 20 years ago. Mm-hmm. Like you never knew, got a little bit of burn, you know? So that's, uh, what is that, 15 years ago. But between, aside from that, we don't get no exposure. Like, our fans know we're out. Everybody else be like, how you been, man? What's up, dude? What you been up to? You know, and our fans be like, what do you mean? So it's, you know, so it's, it's that, to me, that's kind of a feat. Being on tour with Tribe Called Quest and De La, like our first major tour, to me, that was like, oh, damn, we're real rappers. And people were coming to see us and knew our words and all that kind of stuff. Being on Wax, that song Burnt with Dell, like going and being able to purchase yourself on Wax, to me, that's like, okay, that is a, you're officially a rapper at that point. But for Hiro, it's just like it's been such a struggle the whole time that you don't even get to look up and be like, oh, we're doing it. Because, I mean, are we doing it? You know, like, yeah, as far as, okay, people, we have, we occupy a certain space in the world. But it's like, you look at a Wu-Tang, them dudes be going gold and platinum and shit. You know, be having Grammys and shit. We don't got none of that stuff. Not that it matters. I'm not saying it like that, but I'm saying like, so you're not sitting around like, yeah, I got this Grammy. I got this award or my shit is platinum or none of that. You're like, shit, we're still pushing. Like, it's damn near like our survival and existence is the proof of our, I mean, it, it the longevity is the proof of our importance, but it's it's like a self, self-proof kind of, you know, like I'm still here, therefore I'm still here, you know, but no, nah, it's never been a moment where I'm like, yeah, we're doing it because, I mean, are we, you know, I guess just as dudes who are willing to do their own thing, regardless of the climate around them, like we're from Oakland, California, you know what I'm saying though, like this is home of the Panthers and home of crack. And home of the pimps. And home, you know what I'm saying though? Like the home of the hippies. So the fact that we we have all those different influences but are markedly different from all of that, to me is testament to our willingness to do our be ourselves. Like I don't ever have to act like Tajay in the world. And that to me is what I want people to remember is that if you do yourself, be yourself, People are going to love you or hate you for it, but you'll never have to put on airs or fake it. And that is the most liberating shit, like, on earth to me. You know, I mean, we spend so much time wearing masks and wearing armor and shit, like, because of our jobs or because of our 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 lifestyles or the people we surround ourselves with we feel are important that... To be able to not have to put on any of that stuff. Like, I don't got to wear no jewelry. You know what I'm saying, though? Like, I mean, I have to be a respectful human being to people. Maybe that I might not want to be. You know, my fans might be assholes or they might be bothering me or something like that. Or just, you know, being overbearing. But aside from being having to give out the normal human respect everybody has, like, I don't got to front like I'm just like some special dude. You know, I just make music, man. So to me, that's it, that we sort of made it cool to be yourself. Like, I would say, De La made it cool to be different. You know, or the native tongues. Like, oh, we're hella different from everybody. We're like, it's cool to be yourself, too. And yourself may be different. I mean, we're different. But you see what I'm saying, though? Like, there was, De La was like, no, nah, we're not going to be these chest-puffed-out bravado dudes. We don't have to dress in, in b-boy clothes. I think as a kid growing up here, especially now, where it's just, like, all about exterior and all about this sort of image and swag, you know what I'm saying? It's it's important to be able to ground yourself and be yourself. Kids in my generation made it not possible to have big concerts or fun because we shot everybody and stabbed the shit out of everybody. You know what I'm saying, though? B- before, before the show even started half the time, you know? So hip-hop arose as an alternative to that. So for our gen- the golden era generation, which was making all this great music, to actually almost destroy the live presentation of it by the violence that we brought to it it's it's kind of sad for the kids because they don't realize like this is a live performance art this ain't really a recorded art form it didn't start getting recorded till later and you know like that was almost what uh beach street all these were like we're gonna go find these kids they're ill yo they just be in the streets doing that shit we're gonna find them we're gonna record them and put them all you know what i'm saying though and copy them and study and analyze them shit but really it was about like, you just go hip, hip-hop is a verb, and you just went and did that shit, and it had nothing to do with no commodified product. Like, I wasn't breaking. 
to make some money on the street corner. People realize you could, and that's great that we can feed our families from it. But like, I don't rap to make records. I may I got hella songs that ain't never coming out. Never. I'm not even interested in putting them out. They are just therapy, or or you know, like not good songs. You know what I'm saying? Though, or even if they are good, it's just like uh, that was just working through to this. It's what iteration to get to these final things. But the live, the live aspect, not just the live aspect as far as the rapper showmanship, the live aspect as far as people going out, breaking in the crowd, you know what I'm saying, though? Ciphering, I mean, it's still ciphers to an extent, but you know, like just going out and hip hopping as a verb instead of going and seeing hip hop as an object. Man, just check out the website, hieroglyphics.com. I got a new clothing line coming called Pro Intel Co. Check that out, man. Pro Intel Co. Pinko. Check it out. Find what you love or, or, or find something and work hard at it, man, and, and, and push it because if not, you, you wasting space, man, you know, really. And I don't, it ain't about competition for resources. Like you're wasting my space. You're just like, like, this is it. This might be it. You don't know, you know, so go hard, go hard.